Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldo Roll. And, and I'm Horia Stoshansky. And today we have as our guest, uh, Al Shalloway. And welcome, Al. It's really good to have you here. It's good to be here. It's good to see you all again. Yeah, yeah. We It's been a while since we had, had one of our chats, so we're looking really forward to today. So why is Al a guest on The Focus? Now, he's one of those veterans that uh, you, meet, uh, you meet about once or twice in your lifetime or in your career that's been, been there, done that, got the T-shirt on a few continents, on a few uh, different uh, things, etc. So we reckon that he would provide us with quite a lot of valuable and unique information about adaptive oversight. We met Al about three years, three and a bit years ago, after PMI bought his company. And we started working straight away on the PMI DAVSC offering. And Horia, Gareth and myself, we all joined in on helping Al to develop that uh, certification. And we had some really deep and long chats about all things value stream and what are the foundations, etc. We've had some really good uh, laughs. We've had some really good uh, challenges to Al, and Al has, has, has pushed some good challenges back on us during those interactions. And after Al has left uh, the PMI, um, we actually started talking to him about other initiatives post PMI and the stuff that he's, he's actually doing now at the moment is very interesting, but I would like to think that we have a little bit of a finger in that pie in helping uh, Al to get it launched where we are. But before I ramble on and carry on, let's ask Al, tell us a little bit about your experience. What's your life story? Okay, well, I first got to say something about my relationship with Aldo and Horia. So they helped me build the Discipline Agile Value Stream Consultant. And the standing joke for me is Aldo would always tell me what I left out and Horia would always tell me what I did wrong. Uh, <laughs> so as gracious as they're being about me, they are really good in and of themselves and have bet, had a big contribution in shifting my thinking a lot about adaptive management and other things. So um, this was a dangerous question, of course, as Aldo knows, but he's trusting me here because he knows I can talk and talk and talk. I've been called getting a, a drink of water from a fire hydrant more than once. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to keep my story to what I consider relevant. So we'll talk about some personal things because I'm realizing that some of the insights and the way I work have to do with some experiences I had in the 80s. Um, so I was in software <laughs> starting in 1970, basically when I got to university, I have a varied degree. I have a master's from MIT in uh, engineering, computer science and engineering, a master's in mathematics from Emory, uh, bachelor's from Emory in mathematics. And actually I got honors in psychology. So I'm kind of pretty well-rounded, but it's been a shift for me. My in interactions with Don Reinertsen of all people, has shifted me from being mostly mathematician to about equal mathematician and engineering. And that's a big compliment. I, I think I'm much better in the way I think, much more pragmatic. Still maybe too much abstract mathematician, but I, I like to think I'm balanced and probably not. But in the 80s, I had something very interesting happen. And what it was is I took a course, a personal development course, where I learned from an experiential point of view that I was not governed by the logic I'd always thought I was governed by through my math degrees. One of the reasons I got into math, that you can live a world amongst yourself, never talking to anybody else and having a good, good conversation. I'm not sure you get anything done, but it's interesting anyway, because it was very theoretical math that I did. And I kind of got into programming and mathematics because I didn't have to be bothered by anybody. And I was very what people called an extroverted programmer, which meant I looked at your shoes. And that might be hard <laughs> to believe, but yeah, that was it. And when I was at IBM, I had one guy I kept remembering, kept putting his hand under my chin to lift my face so I would look at him. Even then I would just look at his mouth, but at least I was close to the face. Uh, but what I learned in this workshop 
or is a few things. One is that we create our reality in our own conversation with ourselves, what I'll call our listening. Actually, I didn't name that, but that's what the guy who I learned from, one of them was Fernando Flores, very brilliant guy. Um, and we have conversations with ourselves, even when we think we're having a conversation with somebody else, all it does is it affects the conversation we're having inside our head. If you're wondering what the hell is Al talking about, that's the conversation I'm talking about, that buzz that's going on all the time. And one of the things I learned is if you're going to have an impact on somebody, logic isn't the way to do it, but impacting that conversation is the way to do it. And you have to come from that person's perspective. And I learned this in the 80s, and I don't know I paid a lot of attention to it, except as a way originally to create curriculum. I realize you have to lay things out step by step. But more recently, I've been really intrigued by this because the Agile community, in my opinion, is at a turning point now. Uh, there's a lot of upset. I mean, I've been kind of a lot of people talk about me leading it. Man, every day, somebody's got some post about the Agile Industrial Complex or about Scrub or about SAFE. It's, it's not, I'm not leading the charge, guys. There's just a lot out there that's messed. And the question is, why is that? What is it about human nature that has this happen, has what I would consider to be almost an insane workspace right now? And the reason I call it an insane workspace is it's not as effective as we'd like it to be, yet we keep trying it. And there's not been an alternative. And one of the reasons I'm on this podcast is I know Novavi, I know the crew there, and they're trying to change it. They have a different perspective. And to me, this is what we need to do. We need to start taking a truly... Oh, I don't know how to say this. I don't mean intellectual, and I would say scientific and engineering, but most people don't truly understand science. I, I mean, I'm not trying to in, in, insult people, but most people are not truly trained in engineering and science to understand what it's meant. So maybe since I put my foot in it now, I got to explain a little bit. It doesn't mean <laughs> you've had me on a long day. I started training this morning at 4.30, so maybe I'm a little tired, but I'll, I'm just going to put it out there anyway. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Not understanding science or engineering does not mean people aren't smart. That's one thing that people get wrong. He, look, my wife and I, we were when we first got together 34 years ago, we were called the high-tech high touch. You can guess I was the high tech. She was a massage therapist and we were quite different. But even back then, I never considered myself smarter than her and not just for self-preservation reasons, <laughs> but because that's not a good thing, True. but I never that's did. Good to hear, Al. <laughs> yeah, no, but I never did. And the reason I did it is in many, many ways, she was so much smarter than me. Empathy, how to raise kids. I've got a great relationship with my daughter and I won't say it's solely because of her, but man, she opened the door for it. She understood things that I had no clue. I look back and I say, Al, how did you not know that? But I didn't know that. So I joke that only bartenders, hairstylists, Uber drivers, and, and uh, barbers have a right to have an opinion about everything because for them, it's a job description. But for us, we have to have competence. So understanding science and engineering doesn't mean you're not smart if you don't know it. So I didn't mean to imply that, apologize if you thought that. But I meant there's a mechanism that many people aren't trained in, which is how do you take a model of understanding and how do you try something and how do you course correct and understand your model and continuously change it and the two play with each other. And this is actually a skill. It's, a, it's, a, it's not just a skill, it's a learned process, which is almost completely absent in the Agile community right now. I mean, there are a lot of, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of individuals who are teaching it, but the main frameworks don't. And the reason I mentioned this, going back, why did I talk that about our languaging? Is if we're in an echo chamber where we hear the same thing over and over again, then we create a reality where the scientific approach isn't being used, where it's thought, oh, that's abstract. Oh, that's just academic. No, that's not what scientific means. It means that you're steering with theory and you're steering with actual experience. Deming talks about you need both. If you don't have theory, you can't actually learn because there's no baseline to learn. But if you just have it, so experience is expensive, but theory by itself is no good either because you gotta see how it's working. So one of the things we need to do is get down to what really works, not what's a few people driving. 
and I'm going to throw this one last thing. I know I didn't really tell my life story. I'll tell a little bit more after this one comment, but I don't know. This is just really present in my mind because I've just started a community where I'm trying to create a group of people who want to learn about all this stuff. So somewhere I'm sure you'll have references. They can give you some reference to that. But, but when you think about it, 60, 70, 80% of the methods that our organizations, our world is now, are being controlled by three, four, five people. That's astounding, isn't it? Think about it. What's the influence of Scrum? Really one person. I know it's Ken, Ken and Jeff, but if you've been around for 20 years, you know Jeff just goes along with what Ken says. What's safe? Well, you got Dean. So those two people have this inordinate amount of influence, which makes no sense whatsoever. That alone should tell you something's off. And these are huge echo chambers we have. And if we're creating a reality in our own conversations, then these echo chambers are creating a lot of people's realities who don't know how to break out of it. And that's why I tied that together. Um, that's all I got for the moment. Other stuff will pop in, I'm sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, no, here's what I did say I wanted to say. Sorry, sorry, one more thing. Good. So from a technical point of view, let me give you that history. So after school, I've worked, uh, did a lot, did a lot of, I wrote a lot of software over 30 years from 70 to 2000, all sorts of industries shifted into coaching as a programmer, design patterns, written five books or co-written five books, starting with design patterns and other things. But when I formed that objectives in 2000, in 1999, I did, we did a little bit of technical training, actually did a lot of technical training, but then I moved into process, scrum, XP, lean, Con, I formed Lean Kanban University, which I later left. And that's why it's not Kanban University because I was the Lean guy. David was the Kanban guy. Uh, got into SAFE. Uh, I've been accused of being a serial adopter, which I say guilty and I'm proud of it. This is what's called continual learning. Uh, you learn something and then you see, oh, that's not working so well, so let's go to something else. Uh, things like flow and lean and theory of constraints, I've stayed with for 20 plus years because they are really good, but I've come and gone with uh, like safe and scrum because I've seen better ways. Uh, and what in 2019, I was purchased or net objectives, but as my company was purchased by the PMI, built the discipline agile value stream consultant, which I still think is right now the best uh, high end uh, approach. I'm working on the next generation of that, but it's uh, that'll take a while because obviously I sold my IP, so I can't use, I can't use what I sold. So this has been a big labor. Uh, and uh, I formed Success Engineering. And the name of that is because it really is about success. And what's the method for getting there? I don't mean by engineering, it's mechanistic. Uh, nobody builds really elegant bridges. Take a look at Gaudi stuff, you know, art, mm. it's art at times. That's the kind of engineering, it's design, architecture. I'm not talking about the outdoor construction of overpasses. And what I'm doing now is I'm actually not only filling in the gaps on what I think it takes to do good business discovery and then development, deployment and support, which is really my gig, I suppose, but what's the better way to educate? And these two day intense three day courses is a very ineffective way, low retention. People don't have an opportunity to take it into their workplace. Now, if you're gonna do it as a precursor to a massive engagement, that's okay, because then you bring in consultants and all that. But I really, you really want to do training and coaching over time. So I'm in this process of what I call ongoing education. I have several programs where you learn what could be done in a two-day course, but you take three or four months to do it because you do a little bit and you learn a little bit. You actually do it in your workplace and I'm there. It's live. It's instructor, but it's not e-learning. And I'm figuring out basically how to do this across the board in many different uh, applications. I've had 20 years of trying this on and off, but now I'm really intensely doing this. And um, this is what I now have just recently formed, what I call the Amplio Community Practice Guided Study, which is free because it's we meet twice, twice a month or every other week. Because I'm so frustrated with people doing the wrong thing, I decided I'm going to donate that time to try to make an impact. Uh, it beats doing one-off seminars and well, actually, it takes a lot more than I thought it would, but I'm very pleased with it. So there you go. Maybe not my life story, but gives a pretty good rounding of where I'm coming from and what I'm doing. 
Yeah, that's outstanding. And um, I was amazed by your um, almost um, telepathic um, sensing of the echo chambers uh, topic. It echoes our previous interviewer the other day. So it's like, wow, how did you know? <laughs> because it's out there and anybody who's observant will notice it. Exactly. And the people who don't, the people who are in the echo chamber are typically saying, what echo chamber? Exactly. <laughs> it's hard to get through <laughs> yeah yeah i think you like the story of plato's cave um if, if you go find the analogy of plato's cave um it's oh, exactly that I, I have written about how i am the guy in plato's cave <laughs> <laughs> so i know just what you're talking about okay i, I mean yeah. literally i have a post sometime years back it says man i'm in this and people just don't want to hear it and they they blind themselves mm -hmm. by saying, well, the world is complex, so we can't understand it. Well, you know what? If you don't believe you can understand the world, as Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you are correct. Now, I don't know we'll get into this topic, but I totally believe this is not just my own belief. And I'm not justifying it by selling, saying Ellie Goldrat said this in The Choice, highly recommend reading The Choice. If you like the goal, you like The Choice just as much. It's a different topic. It's about critical thinking and how do you approach problems. But if but there are ways to deal with a complex world without buying into complexity means we can't tell what's happening. And you bring that, if that's a bit germane to this, I'll let you all bring that up. But boy, that's a topic I love to talk about. Yeah, anyway, that's, that's fantastic. Let let's let's actually continue with that. Um, just reminding ourselves, our main focus and intention at the focus is oversight. And we mean by that this way of being a little bit detached and looking at things from a slight remove from above, from below, um, but also noticing what we're missing. Yeah, that's why oversight, because you oh, also say, no, oops, I got an oversight. Yeah. Well, what's really amazing is that these relate to each other a lot, <laughs> and, uh, which I have, yeah, like you're nodding. I said, well, I'm not, why am I not surprised? You know, <laughs> um, well, I'm never surprised. I remember, so I got to tell this story, although, because this, I still remember this funny. So we were doing this DAVSC workshop and they're always giving me these insights. And at one point, all those talking for, I don't know, the fourth, fifth time in the workshop. And I'm like shaking my head like this. And I know what he's thinking. He's thinking, oh, Al is getting so tired of, of, of him telling me what's going on. But, and I told him, no, Al, that's not what I'm thinking. What I'm thinking is, how does this guy know all this stuff? Uh, so I'm never surprised when they've <laughs> made the connection. So let me give you in like a couple of minutes, five minutes maybe, this whole thing about complaints. Complexity, And I've got to give a little background just to make sure people are looking at it the way I'm looking at it. And by the way, I'm not sure I can prove this, except that I've had success with it. Ellie Goldratt's had success with this. Don't look at my success as much as, as his. And I wasn't really able to nail this. I've been working on this thing for like 15 years. I read the choice and, I, oh, that's the missing piece. This guy's talking about it directly. And what he was talking about is that although the world appears complex, if you view it as complex, you're going you're gonna to look for complex solutions. It's going to be a massive problem. That in fact, there are a few constraint, a few constraining ideas that if you look at them and you discover what they are, the world appears to be much simpler. And what's really cool is these ideas are not in conflict with each other, but are in fact in harmony with each other. Now, I had seen this in the technical area of design patterns with software. Like I said, I was programming for like, like 40 hours a day on average from 1970 to 2000, because even in school, I was just crazy programmer. Um, when I had businesses, it was developing software. So I ran the business. I also wrote the software. And in the technical world, I discovered this was true. And there were like six qualities of code. That if you manage things like coupling and cohesion, these are nothing new. I actually created the notion of testability. At least I was the first person I remember talking to about it. About it. That's back in 99, 2000. Maybe it existed before then. But that's a quality is the co-testable things of that nature. And I'd always thought that was true in design. And in software, it must be true also in process. But I hadn't really worked it through. But from about 2005 on, I was watching very smart people 
make changes. And I looked, I also looked at very smart people who didn't make change, but tried. And I found these patterns of success and these patterns of failure. And I was always asking myself, what are these people looking at? What are they thinking about? How do they come up with this brilliance? Because sometimes it was like magic. You know, they would talk to people and I'd wonder, what are they, somebody would ask a question and I wondered how they're going to respond. And I had no clue, but then something brilliant came out of their mouth, just the right point. And I wondered, what are they looking at that they can ask such great questions? I did this for years. I'm not kidding. I was blessed to have some really sharp people in my company and I would go go out there. And I, I contributed some too, but I had some really brilliant folks and I was just soaking it up. And what I noticed and then what I really got with gold rats work was that in the area of knowledge work or in kind of process oriented things you could look for things and he called it inherent simplicity and i called it the value stream impedance scorecard and i gave it that name not to be different but because i look at the value stream the work from the idea until it goes and gets consumed that's the value stream well what's resisting what's making that not flow that's impedance my engineering background impedance is a measure of, of resistance to electrical current. And I just couldn't come up with a better name. And scorecard was just some way to look at it, not so much a direct metric. So I started looking for these things. And what I discovered was that there's more damage being done by not doing what we know to do. Now, but by the way, what I mean by the value stream impedance scorecard, here I'm looking for the list, but before I find it, I'll just tell you some of the things I know about it, just as from memory. And you actually know this yourself. If you ever have gone into a company and you say, wow, these guys are good. What are they doing? And, um, and sometimes you go, uh, sometimes you'll go into a company and you'll say, man, how do they get anything done? Intuitively, intuitively, what you're looking at is, is this how effective, what works, what doesn't work and how tuned are people to this and intuitively, we know this stuff, but we somehow don't believe, many people don't believe you can quantify it, that you can look at what are the metrics for it, or not metrics rather, but what are the factors? So I'm going to tell you, I call these vectors because vectors have a direction and an amplitude. And I'm going to just read, I, I'm not going to go into this in detail, just to give you an idea because it sounds abstract if I don't give an example of what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is things should be small should work on small things. Well, guess what? That sounds pretty agile, doesn't it? We work on small batches. That's what flow and lean is about. Ellie Goldright and, and the goal talks about sometimes working on small batches is all it takes to bring a, a system under control. We got to manage the cues the, when the work is waiting. Don Reinertsen talks about cue management. Kanban's all about work and process, managing cues. Are we getting quick feedback? How can we pivot if we don't know we're doing something wrong? What about product quality? Is it high or low? That has to do with both how the customer likes it or how we can adjust it. Are we overloading work? If we're overloading work, we're going to be putting delays. Delays create waste. In the mantra in manufacturing, maybe eliminate waste, but in our world, it should be eliminate delays because they'll cause waste. Can we see what's happening? Can, do we have visibility? Plus, I like Edgar Schein's comment. We don't think and talk about what we see we are only able to see what we're able to think and talk about. So if you don't, if you're not thinking and talking about stuff, you're not going to see the stuff. The brain's an amazing filter. Are we organized properly with the people? So we reduce handoffs. Are development teams focused on one thing or are they working on three or four value streams? And then what, are you attending to the value stream? Now, all that stuff kind of sounds reasonable, I think. And I suggest that you can see what's going on for a lot of stuff, not everything. So I got two more definitions and then I'll give you the drum roll answer to the, what was it? $64,000 question. <laughs> uh, so first I have to describe a system and I love Russ Acoff's view of it. Highly recommend, look for, what if Russ Acoff did a TED talk? It's the best 12 or 14 minutes or whatever it is. It's amazing. Russ is so brilliant or was so brilliant. <clears throat> and he talks about systems are not about the components in the system. They're about the relationships between the components in the system and the metaphor he uses, or analogy, I guess, example, whatever. Take 50 good cars, take the best parts of the 50 best cars, put them together, you have a pile of junk because they don't relate to each other. Systems are about how things interact. Now, the problem is sometimes these interactions are simple, like a car. 
Sometimes they're complex, like the human being. The heart affects the lungs, affects the pancreas. Everything affects everything else. You can't tell what the hell is going on here. Very difficult. So complex systems have this added quality that some of the relationships cannot be seen because they're so interactive. So we think, oh, well, if I can't see it, I can't understand it, I can't manage it. No, 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 I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because of two reasons. First of all, most of what's going on in products and companies is like driving backwards on the wrong side of the road, looking through your rear view mirror, complaining how hard it is. We do so much wrong. I'm going to assert that there's more waste caused by not doing what we know how to do than there is by the curveballs complexity throws at us. Okay, so I'm going to say that. But now I'm going to say what I really got from Goldratt and this harmony thing. It's true. We might work on something we know, like those nine things I mentioned. And it's true, there might be something we don't see that has those nine things not give us the answer. But what they then expose is what we didn't see. And now this complex <clears throat> system becomes more illuminated. So the concept is do what you know, it'll expose what you don't know, and you'll always either make progress or you'll learn. You won't get frustrated. Okay, $64,000 question answer. How do you deal with complexity? Well, first of all, there's no way you're going to anticipate things like the pandemic or what's going on in Ukraine. Black Swan events, by definition, are unpredictable. I'm not telling you how to predict these, okay? However, you can control what's in your arena and you can control maybe the wrong word because you have to be responding. You can make your system pivotable, meaning that I, I can keep working process low, I can change, I'm getting feedback, I can see what's going on. So in a black swan event, so I'm sorry, you do two things. One is you use this value stream insights to be effective to not have too much work in play so you can pivot. So you're effective and efficient under your control when a black swan event comes, you can pivot because you can't anticipate that. The idea that you have to try things and run experiments is see, if you have a theory and you do something that's consistent with the theory that you validated, to me, that's not an experiment. You have an expectation it's gonna work. I've, used, I've created new practices a lot of times. And every time I fully expected it to work, and actually most of the time I make a new practice, it does work because I have a good theoretical basis for it. Now, I, of course, validate it. But not everything you've never done before needs to be called an experiment. See, when you do something where you have no theory, now that's an experiment. When you're trying to validate a theory, that's an experiment. This notion of fail fast in experiments is just drives me nuts. You can take advantage of what you know. So that's where complexity comes in. Now, what was I supposed to tie this into? It could be the, the oversight, because I can explain that too. Okay. Now, you guys know enough that if you want to slow me down, you got to raise your hand or something. No like worries. That. Keep oh, I'm going. I'm just going to keep going. Keep going. I'm on a roll, because I've been thinking about this a lot, and, uh, and I'm fine to keep going. Okay. Keep going. So, okay. So let's look at governance. I know that's not what you mean by oversight, but I want to talk about what governance is. <clears throat> But here was the other thing that I learned in the 80s. And I'll mention the core. I'm not embarrassed by it. It was a little cultish, I admit. But it was the S training in 83. I took the S training. I took it again when it converted into Landmark. And yeah, it was a little cultish. But you know what? I saw people who got their life back. I mean, who like literally weren't really happy at all. In fact, I could say that about me. But I was pretty happy. I've, been a, I've had a blessed life. And when you get something that makes you be a better person in your view. Of course, you kind of get attached to something. It's not a problem. Landmark's not like that. S was a little bit like that because it was a lot more experiential. But it was in the S training, I discovered that I was literally afraid of people. That's why I was an introvert. I didn't want to talk to people. I'd rather hang out with my friends. But I didn't know I was afraid of people. I would just say, why well, spend time with strangers? I got my friends to spend time with. And I eventually learned that, no, I, I wasn't going to be bound by all this. I was going to get past my fears. And I'm not afraid of people now. It took years. Well, every now and then, but <laughs> normally not. But what was amazing was these instructors they had, like 20 different people. These people 
they had an ability I have not ever seen in anybody else. Literally, since then, I've not even seen anybody. These guys were so trained. You could, they could talk, you could talk to them and they could almost like, it was like reading their mind. Like they were reading your mind. And how did they do this? And I know it wasn't a trick because at some point I was up being produced these as an avocation, as a hobby. I, I liked hanging around and I actually was the, not the guy in the front, not that skilled, but the guy, that guy in the front was dependent upon. I was that guy. So I knew everything that was going on. There's no way. I mean, I was producing the thing. I knew what was happening. And I, I still had no idea how these did it. <laughs> they did it. I was like, they had a skill. And I finally realized what they noticed was if somebody asked a question, what would somebody have to be thinking to ask that question? In other words, and, and they didn't know for a fact, but they would consider that to ask a question like that. What would somebody have to believe? Now, I'll give an example of how I, I use this. I've gotten somewhat a little bit of this skill now, but I'm, I use it in my coaching, but that's not the main point. But I, I'll give an example. So I remember one workshop early on, 2002, three, four, something like that. It was a certified scrum master training we were putting on. And there was this guy who was an absolute asshole in the workshop. I mean, he was so bad. And I had somebody else leading the workshop because we didn't have any CSTs at the time. And this instructor was really good, but at launch of the first day, he comes to me and says, look, I'd have already thrown this guy out of the workshop if it was my course, but it's your course, meaning me. So <laughs> he wanted me to throw him out. And I said, well, yeah, he's been bad, but let's talk to him first. So we go and talk to him and, and I asked him, I said, you don't seem to be very happy here. That was, that was an example. Why would somebody be doing what he's doing? So he had to come from that he was actually a reasonably human being. He said, yeah, I'm not, you're wasting my time. So I said, oh, so you're not happy because you're here for a two-day workshop and you think we're wasting your time. And he said, yeah. I said, well, how, how are we wasting your time? And I already had an idea, but I was trying to get it pulled out and see what his thinking was. My idea was he thought that the way you do a workshop is you don't have them figure stuff out. You just tell them what they need to know. That's what I'm thinking, but I don't know that's true. So I'm asking him, so what is it? And he says basically that. He says, well, you're not telling me how to solve these problems. And I'm saying, yeah, that's right, we're not. But let me ask you this. In your work, do you ever have a time where you don't know how to solve your problems? He says, yeah, all the time. Would it be useful for you to figure out how to solve your problems when you don't know how to solve your problems? And he thought about that. He said, he said, yeah, that would be useful. He said, well, see, actually what we're trying to do is teach you how to solve problems when you don't know how to solve your problems. And you could just see him embracing this. See, because what I had thought might be the case was he had this thought that he always needed to know how to solve his problems. And that us putting him in a situation where it was obvious he didn't know how to solve his problems was threatening to his ego. Mm. I didn't know that for a fact, but, you know, I mean, the guy could have just been an asshole, you know, but, but then I had no hope and I'd have to throw him out of the class. But it occurred to me, maybe he wasn't really an asshole. He was just had a belief system that had him behave this way. And I was probing it. Now, why am I saying all this? Because it's these belief systems that nobody wants to talk about. And if you talk about it, you're labeled a basher. But it's these belief systems you have to get to. Yeah, Aldo. Okay, what, what, did, I, what did I forget? Oh, nothing. <laughs> that's, a really, that's a really good point, uh, Alan. And... Um... Now, if I look at it through um, <clears throat> an adaptive oversight lens, this, these people in those oversight positions, they are sometimes seen as that person that you just described. And also, right. they, they sometimes, not they, but the oversight practitioners, we see that tension as well, is, is that they also have the same opinion of the people doing the actual work, the practitioners. So how do you go about solving that? You, you, you've given a hint, but for our, for our listeners, that okay. tension there, you, we, we've sat with that traditionally, but both add so much value. How do you solve that? Yeah, so the way I suggest solving it is you first have to look, what are the mindsets of governance versus what are the mindsets of aligned oversight? They are different. And this is not a guarantee because some people who've learned 
something and they've been effective at, they believe their belief system is reality and is their value. Upton Sinclair said something I think very insightful, which is it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon him not understanding it. So if you've got somebody who's supposed to do governance and his job is to do governance and that's what they believe their job is, then anything that suggests that that's not really what they should be doing is gonna be a threat to their job. And somehow the way our brains are wired, a threat to their value and out of that, a threat to their relationship with their loved ones and they're gonna die alone without money starving in the street. I know that's weird, but th that's something also I learned in the S training. All this stuff is wired together in this insane model of things. So what I look, look at, there's another concept here that has to be looked at. And this is the next generation to me of effective business. So in, in Waterfall, we had these hierarchies. And what we did is we decided, let's get smaller batches. I mean, they weren't effective because of the, you know, everything was in these silos and all that. And then now you're going to get bat smaller batches and work together and all that. But look at the Agile space. Agile didn't break the silos up. They just put the focus down at the bottom, trying to have teams that had all the skills, very team-based. And look at something like SAFE, where you have hierarchies. Do you start at the bottom up, like Scrum would say? Do you start at the top down, like a lot of leadership people are saying? Notice that top down or bottom up, what is the one thing that's consistent with both of those is they're built around hierarchies, exactly. You can't do the wrong thing right. Hierarchical structures. Now, I'm not saying you need flat hierarchies. I did not say that. So, in fact, there's very little evidence that flattening hierarchies does any good. But there are tall hierarchies that are totally ineffective because they're totally ineffective. It's not hierarchy that's bad. It's just usually hierarchical thinking is bad. Okay, but not the hierarchy itself. Anyway, one of the things that I realized years ago, in fact, it's funny, sometimes I don't even realize it, but I go back to some of my old blogs. I said, man, I was talking about this back in 2006, is the value stream. See, the beauty of the value stream is you can get everybody on the page. We're going to add value. And yeah, leadership, management, budgeting is early in one phase, and everybody's at the end, but it's like a pipe. And I know it's not really a pipe. It's more of a network, and it's all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I get it. It's a metaphor. But if you plug it up at any one place, it's all plugged up. And when you start thinking in terms of value streams, you're all in the same boat. It doesn't do any good to be really effective in one part and not effective in another. When you're in hierarchies, you can talk about, well, my, my part is doing great. I'm giving this great leadership. Why aren't these guys listening mm -hmm. to me? Or I'm at the bottom. So, well, we're doing our part good. Those leadership and Frozen management people are the problem. See, you can, you can conflict with each other in hierarchies. Value streams are a different matter. All of you work together to open it up or one of you blocks it is all it takes. Mm. So we need to have this different mindset and governance and oversight shift when you shift from hierarchies to value streams. See, if you're in a hierarchy, then I have to look at the people who... I'm responsible for either managing or over, overviewing them and governing them and all that. So I'm the authority. They got to be doing it right. It's a, it's a me versus them. My whole job is based on finding stuff they're doing wrong. Think about that. If you're governance and you never find anything wrong, you have no job. So you have to find things wrong. <laughs> it's my time story. at all cost. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the best story about finding things wrong comes from one of my heroes, Mark Twain. So as you know, he was a, you know, wrote articles. He wrote a lot of books, but he would write in a way that he considered to be perfect. And he didn't want editors making any changes, but he knew their job was to make changes. So he had this, it's actually a perfect story for a lot of reasons, because it says, if you work with people, you have to let them do what they have to do. So his solution to giving something to an editor where he didn't want them to make any changes because it was perfect, but he knew they were going to, meant you had to have them take out the stuff. He had to put stuff in that he <laughs> knew they would take out and not take out anything else. So what he would do is he would write something. It was perfect. He didn't want an editor touching it. And then he'd add profanity to it. 
because he knew they would take out the profanity and then be getting their job done. That's gaming so, the system, isn't it, Al? Of course it's gaming the system. <laughs> <laughs> but, but see, Twain understood the people he was working with. And he understood, I'm not suggesting you all do that. I just thought it was a funny story. It's one of my favorite stories I've heard. So in governance, it's a me versus them. Mm. There's no partnership in governance. I'm watching that you're getting your job done. Where's the partnership in that? I'm not helping you get your job done. I'm just telling you when you messed it up. Now, that's a silo hierarchical kind of thing. It's not good. Now, to understand how to shift that, however, I didn't, by the way, none of this stuff have I figured out, like figured out. I've seen it work and then I maybe figured out how to explain it. This is basically lean flow. Lean, okay, I've, I mentioned lean. I've got to say something about that because lean is getting bastardized so much. It's just irritating. To me, Scrum saying it's based on lean is an insult to lean. And I mean that seriously. <laughs> and, and I have some evidence for this. As far as I know, I was the first one who said, that, or maybe I just said it louder and longer, so it was irritating. But back in 2007, I said, if you considered Scrum to be a partial implementation of lean, you would do better Scrum. And I said that more than once on the Scrum Development Group, which was the big user group back in the day. And uh, Ken got so mad at me, threw me off. The, he said, well, I'm trying to sell lean. I wasn't trying to sell lean. I was trying to help people doing Scrum. And I didn't say Scrum is based on lean. I said, if you consider it a partial implementation, like you avoid handoffs of chief flow and all this. And he, he rolled Jeff out to say, no, Scrum wasn't based on lean. It's based on complex adaptive systems. And Ken, of course, thinks it's based on empirical process control. And now, lo and behold, 13 years later, he says Scrum is based on Lean, but they're, they're opposed. The mindsets of Scrum and the mindsets of Lean are different. If you're interested, I can give you a reference. I've written a dozen articles on this. But the point is, Lean is not about eliminating waste, at least not in the knowledge work area. And basically, here's my advice. If you hear somebody saying Lean is about eliminating waste, no, they don't have a real deep understanding of what Lean is. Yeah. Lean is founded on systems thinking, but it's really about learning. It's about continuous learning. And out of the continuous learning, continuous improvement. That's the foundation of it. And it does it by looking at how do we learn to provide more value to our customer? And it's a holistic view of things. And as another aside, since you're letting me just ramble, this is why I like Age of Agile's by Steve Denning so much more because he's talking about the whole thing is about adding customer value and the whole organization aligns to it. And why I don't like Accelerate by Cotter where I've got the people adding value and then I've got the business being efficient. No, no, no. It isn't the business being efficient to lower costs and the teams adding value. It's that exactly. This is also consistent with the humanocracy, which I really like micro enterprises. <clears throat> Uh, humanocracy is sometimes a bridge too far, but I think I finally can't do it here because I need pictures and things, although I could mention some things. I finally found the bridge step-by-step step to go from where there's no visibility to the micro enterprises. I've been trying to figure this out for, I mean, I agree with the micro enterprise, but how do you get there when you've got a messed up organization? I, I think I now see the steps to use, and it's not new, it's just tying the whole thing together. Actually, I'll say it because I can say it in two minutes to give you a thought process and then you could ask for more information. I am writing this up in a book I'm writing. But think about it. If you're going to add value and you've got a value stream and you can't see anything, good luck. Mm. So maybe number one is visibility. Have organizations where you know all the work. You don't just say somebody gets an idea and they give it to a team. Somebody else gets an idea, they give it to a team. Back 10 years ago, that was common. I don't know if it's common now, but I suspect it still is, but it's not good. You're getting some reaction, although. Do you have a comment on yeah, that? I don't, Do I, that don't, I don't see. I've always wondered if somebody else has an idea and try and push it onto people, why don't you take ownership of that idea and see it through to its end? Um, yes. I've always That's wondered about question that. Because the culture... The culture of the company may make it safer to just give it to them. And if something good happens, you're the winner. And if something bad happens, well, I told them to do it. So risk-free is a problem. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing is that visibility. So you can see work that's going on. But then visibility of value has to go back to the stakeholders. Mm. What stakeholders want? What are their values? And this is a conflict. You have a limited capacity. And so you have to 
see what to do. So now you say, okay, this is the value. I've got visibility what I'm doing. How do I manage it? Well, the next step might be to coordinate it, but that's governance in some sense, people working on the right thing. Well, this is perfect. This, this is going to tie into this. I just had the sense maybe to bring it up, but it's, I see now the tie-in. So, so you start with no visibility, you make visibility, you now see, well, i got to organize this and coordinate all this. That's a lot of work. Well, maybe you ought to do planning. At least get the people together so they can kind of amongst themselves coordinate it instead of me externally coordinating it. But that's still difficult. But what if, if you go back and you tie it to the value that the stakeholders have and everybody sees it and remember it's value stream. So what do we want to put in the value stream? How are we going to work on it? Now you have the potential to align around that. This is where concepts that most agile places don't have. The only two I'm familiar with are ours, the uh, minimum business increment, mm. which is what's this small chunk of value and the move, which I can never remember what it stands for of Steve Tendon's Tame Flow. A brilliant guy in great books. You want to hear more about what I'm talking about and, and outside of the scope of what I'm talking about and deeper than what I'm talking about. Uh, Steve Tendon's a great uh, place in his book, as is Don Reinertsen, you know, and Tom Gill. But I got those three guys give me lots of input. Uh, anyway, so now all of a sudden you've got alignment. We're working on these. And then eventually you can separate these. So we go from no visibility to visibility to visibility of value to coordinating to planning to alignment and then you separate the value streams and you have micro enterprise now that's not the best way to go that's if you're already glommed up if you can make it a micro enterprise just go for it so what's the difference and how does this how the hell does this relate to governance and <laughs> governance and oversight well think about this governance would be checking this externally oversight would be i'm in the game with the mm. people oversight Oversight, I'm not an external force. I'm an internal force. I'm helping these guys. I'm, I'm taking the role of like a coach. See, when you're in the middle, like I, I use a, trying, I was thinking football is natural to me. I mean, American football, but I can, I think I can use soccer too. You know, you can, when you're in the middle of the game and the ball's going upfield and you're kicking it back and forth, it's hard to slow down and stop and look at the big picture especially in soccer sometimes, you know, it's just, it's active. People can do things to you that aren't nice that the refs may or may not catch. <laughs> and so, so the idea that you can be actively involved in something and at the same time, step back and look at the big picture, it's impossible. See, doesn't it sound like red blue to you guys? Yeah. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah. You know, it's about yeah, David yeah. Marquet. I mean, I That's know, right. you know what it is. The red and the blue are, yeah. It's exactly Absolutely. what yeah. it is. That it, you know, sometimes you're busily engaged, engaged in red work. I'm doing stuff and then I have to step back and, and you could switch back and forth, red, blue, red, blue. But sometimes it's nice to have somebody who's watching the whole thing and is looking for things because they know everybody's busy. See, this is oversight to me. It's, so, and, and it's maybe a wrong word because over kind of implies control or, or something. And I know that's not what you mean. And, and yes, this, is a loaded, of, this is a loaded question what? now, Al. Okay. So That's in okay. the beginning, uh, when you were talking about 40 minutes ago, I already captured a question about how important is coaching skills for uh, AO or for oversight practitioners. Now, I, I want to change that question slightly and <laughs> spot the trap here. Okay. Um, no, 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 not a trap. Something you don't know I've been thinking recently. Okay. Because I don't think I've so keep going. I'm would you now say that agile coaches or coaches should fulfill oversight or should oversight practitioners also be seen as coaches? I would say I would say both are true in a sense. And and in that if you're an oversight coach, you need to if you excuse me, if you're doing oversight, you need to know how to coach. But let's ask what is a coach? Because yeah, I have a good. different opinion about as a coach. Okay. <laughs> yes. And a lot of people. Okay. So let me start with, with a little story about something I'm working on. So 20 years ago, I mean, literally 20 years ago, I asked myself the question, what would I do if a big company, I mean, a huge company, like an American Express or somebody, they hadn't come to me, but just imagine mm. somebody, tens of thousands of developers. What would I do if they said, Al, we want you to transform American Express with training and coaching, but 
it's only you, you're the only person we're going to hire in your company, and we're going to use all of our internal people otherwise. What would you do? Now, I wasn't actually thinking that was going to happen, but I thought it was an interesting question, because if you take that question, I've been thinking about this for 20 plus years. When you think about this, what this means is you have to transform education. Mm. You have to make it so it actually retains. Quick one, two, three day training has got 80% retention loss. I mean, it's very low. Retention is 10 to 20%. You don't get to study in your workplace. The time you're in the training, you lose from your workplace. People who are dependent upon you can't use you. So over the last 20 years, I have dallied in remote training, instructor-led remote training, if the technical term, some of it too, is also flipped classroom where I make recordings, people watch, and then I talk to them. Sometimes I do instructor-led. I'm actually not as enamored about flipped classroom anymore because I find, yes, I can give them a recording, but people actually like to talk to me while I'm talking to them. And they learn more talking to you than just saving myself the grace. Now at a university, maybe that's a good way, but for real training, so I've come up with, I do an hour a week, uh, interactive lecture. I give them a problem. I use mirror boards so people can collaborate. A lot of the times that's what we do. And they, so they've learned a skill how to collaborate. Anyway, I'm teaching all this cool stuff. And it's a 13 week program and about, it only takes about two or three weeks when I realize there's a serious problem here. People are picking up the concepts but they have no way to talk about them. And I'm not talking about how, yes, when you train, you learn it deeper. I'm talking about, yeah, they got it. They're not talking about explaining it to somebody that they're a peer with. They're talking about explaining it to another role and they don't know how to do that. And I realized that any education that involves new information and new skills needs to include how to convey that to the people you're going to be working with. Now, so yeah. that, that's what you meant earlier when you talked about skills and people having to have confidence. It's a learned process um, and it's an engineered approach. Is that, is that, it is is that the link? That's exactly right. Now, I'm not trying to play down like the work that Diana Larson does and you know, Linda Rising and a few other people who are well known as teaching coaching skills, teaching facilitation. You guys teach facilitation. Uh, I'm not playing that down at all. That stuff's really good. Uh, I don't teach that, not because I don't think it's really important. I don't teach it for two reasons. One is it's not the best thing I'm at. I mean, why should I do something that there are better people than me? <laughs> I like to do what I'm good at. But the other reason is that takes longer. And I'm not saying that's a problem because some things take longer and you just have to accept that some things are going to take longer. But if somebody's taking a workshop for me on how to be how to introduce new concepts. There's no way they have the time to change either their personality or their listening skills or all this stuff. It's really, really important, but it is on a longer term learning process. Okay. Mm. And, and so, so what I started to do, I'm right, starting to write a book, right? It's about two thirds written. So what I had is this first book, which is Amplio. Amplio is my brand, improve in Latin. Amplio, Lean Agile Teams Masterclass. That's a three, four month workshop. And what I realized is I needed to integrate a coaching workshop. And I decided eventually to pull the book out that I call being a professional coach. And now what this is, it's, I, I don't know if there's another book that's been written like this. If there is, please let me know. Cause I'm not, I mean, I, I'd like to read it, steal their ideas. Uh, I'll give them credit, but you know, I'm, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I don't really think I am reinventing the wheel. I think I'm bringing stuff together. But to me, first of all, being a professional coach means that I am there for a purpose. I'm there to help them. And that doesn't mean to tell them what to do. That never works, but it doesn't work for the reasons people say. I, it's not because people will resist it. It's not because people won't own it as their own. I'm sorry, that's BS. I have been in so many places where people were almost begging me to tell them what to do. And I always refuse. And the reason I refuse is if I tell them they will not have thought through it themselves to the detail they need to get it done when I'm not there and they will fail. Mm. That's a bigger reason. Now, sometimes some people will resist. So I've been in many workshops or many on engagements where like it, I got three days and in the morning of the first day, I said, I know what these guys need to do. I won't tell them though, but I know. So what I do is I start asking questions. See, mm. the difference between me and them is not that I'm smarter. I have, I'm smarter in some things, but they're smarter 
in their business. They know what's going on. They know their problems. I got more experience. I've seen some things. So I will ask questions so they can put the puzzles together. And they, over time, they learn. And then they see themselves how to solve their problem. And I do that not because they resist, but because if I don't do it, they won't see all these little things that I can't possibly know to tell them, but they can figure out they need to know. Mm. This is people closer to the work. Okay. So you, you're doing reversed inquiry-based learning. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And I'm not always right. You know, the beauty of it, by not telling them if I found that I was wrong, by having this inquiry and I learn, oh, this is the right answer, I look like I had the right answer all along. So it actually <laughs> works. Actually, that doesn't happen that often, but it happens. Sometimes I'm right at the front, sometimes I'm not. But here's the point. It is a real inquiry. In other words, I'm not trying to convince them of anything. I'm not trying to sell my idea. I'm trying to discover what works and they have half the game and I have the other half the game. They have the real understanding of what they're trying to do and the real understanding of the problems. I got zillions of things that may or may not work. And by asking the question, we piece it together. And yes, they're a lot more comfortable and yes, they're not likely to resist and they feel respected, which it is a form of respect. And a lot of the times I'm right. And a lot of the times it shifts. I'm never 100% right. I mean, when I say I'm right, I mean like 90% I got it right. It's never 100%. Sometimes I'm like totally wrong. But we get to the solution. And who cares if the initial insight was right or wrong? I don't care. I mean, okay, there's a part of me where that's ice cream and cookies <laughs> and all that. Okay, what can I say? I don't care. But you know what I'm talking about. It's like at the end of the day, in fact, some days when you go through that grinder and you come home and you're totally exhausted because you were wrong at the start and you figured out the solution with them, that's more satisfying than just nailing it the first time. It's more fun. It's just hard. Okay, yeah. so why was I tying all this together? So it's this partnership idea. So when you talk about this oversight, you got to get a better name than that. This partnership, are we doing the right thing where I'm able to step back and see what's going on? It's a partnership. It's, it's, it's highlighted in David Manns. He wrote a book called Creating a Lean Culture. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not sure I recommend reading it unless you're in manufacturing. In manufacturing, it's totally brilliant. And it's brilliant anyway, but you have to be good about taking principles. See, one of the problems with lean and one of the reasons people still talk about lean as reducing variation and eliminating waste, that's what they do in manufacturing. But that's not what we do in knowledge work. So what you have to do is look at the manufacturing practices, see, like I talked about how people, these brilliant trainers were seeing where the mindset was that people are coming up to see, well, what's the principles underneath the lean manufacturing? Then reapply those. So in manufacturing, it might be eliminate waste because you can see it. In software or knowledge work, you can't see the waste. I joke, I did this intensive study. Watch this. I'm going to put my keyboard down. Can you see? Can you see my hands? I'll just place my hands. This is, imagine I have a keyboard. I did intensive studies. This is what a developer looks like writing perfect code. Mm -hmm. okay, now I'm going to show you what a developer looks like writing really bad code. Do you see the difference? I'm kidding. There is no difference. You can't see it. You can't see the waste. So you got to find something you can see that's correlated to waste. And I suggest that's delay in the workflow, delay in feedback, things like that. So what you have to do when you look at this is one of the concepts of lean is that, remember Deming, there's this model, there's this theory. The people doing the work and the people who are coaching or consulting the people doing the work are in partnership with what is the best way to do the work. An oversight or reflection or standing back is simply, and this is what David Mann talks about, is if you all agreed this is the best way to do the work, then why aren't you doing it this way? Because that happens. Yeah. They get pressure. They take shortcuts. They're not disciplined. You don't beat them up. My job is to make sure you're following. No, no, you don't do that. You ask them nicely. Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the times they'll say, oh, yeah, sorry, we forgot. <laughs> I've had a bad day. It's taking a shortcut. Not a good idea. Or sometimes they'll say, you know, we don't think that works anymore. Well, okay, let's talk about it. <coughs> See, that's partnership. Mm. This is a very important concept in Lean and somewhat in Kanban that you have explicit workflow. You make it all visible. Yeah. 
And that's where I want to take a little bit of a, a controversial tangent here is and, and based on what you've just said is about that partnership. In the beginning, just want to step back early in the in the in, in today's chat is <clears throat> we spoke about echo chambers and you made a comment about insane workspaces. And I want to link that to toxic cultures. Um, what I'm hearing is, is that we have a, an, an approach is to co-create and to uh, collaborate about creating that new way of working um, or the new approach. But we all sit to some degree in some toxicity in our workspace. How do you break that down? How do you get out of that before you can start getting that benefits of the collaboration? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not going to claim I know how to do this all the time. Yeah, because I don't and I haven't at times. Um, but but I'll, I'll throw out some points and maybe it all tie together. First of all, people talk about fear and toxicity, and I'm going to suggest it's mostly backwards. The biggest fear people have in a workspace is not their manager, is not the workspace, is not their team. It's what's going on in their head, mm. what they're creating. People's fear of failure, people's fear of not keeping their word, because our culture, actually every culture I know, some to a worse degree. In fact, the United States, you know, Anglo-Saxon culture has one way of what not keeping our promises. We tend to, well, I'm good and I'm tough, so maybe that happens, but it's there's an ego involved. If you go to the east, the far east, sometimes not keeping a promise is I'm no longer in my community. Yeah. So one way we're victims, I'm outcasts and I'm going to die alone. That's the Asian culture. And the other way, it's I'm a martyr and yeah, you know, whatever, they don't understand me and I'm wonderful and all this, but I'm still alone. Victims and martyrs are very similar to each other. They're just different degrees of righteousness. But in both cases, they're abdicating responsibility. So one of the things we have to look at is, is recognize, first of all, that the deepest fears come from inside us not from outside us, okay? And I think you guys are the ones responsible for me. I knew this, but I've really gotten clear about this by reading all these stoic books you turned me on to. So thank you again for all that. I've read several of Ryan Holiday's book. The Obstacle is the Way is one of the biggest ones, but I read the Daily Stoic every day. I've read um, Ego is getting, oh, I hate that. I hate those things. <laughs> ego. See, I thought I had my ego under control because I'm such a nice guy and I take feedback and all that. I was like, oh, shit, hell. Just because you're not an arrogant asshole doesn't mean you don't have this huge ego. That's just ego. <laughs> so I read The Ego is the Enemy as well. Big impact on me. Um, highly recommend to any audience. I mean, I won't say which one's better to read first. If uh, Ego is the Enemy can't be wrong. If you're trying to solve problems, I'd start with the obstacle is the way because that's helped me think much clearer. But anyway, so the first thing you've got to recognize is the fears come from ourselves and then they're triggered by all these outside things. I'm not saying there aren't things outside that are dangerous. Okay, I've been very blessed that I've always, I've only been fired once, I think. Uh, years ago, they demolished my department. Uh, so I didn't have a department, so I left. Uh, the recent thing with the PMI is amicable. I had to start all over, but I'm used to starting over. I've had a series of companies. So I haven't, I've been lucky that I haven't been like, how will I get a job? I've been blessed with that. I know some of you have that fear. So I'm not saying being stoic is easy. I've, I've been more blessed than a lot of other people. So I, I, I don't mean to imply you can just discount all that fear or that it's easy. I do not mean to imply that I've just been a very lucky person where it hasn't been a big deal for me. Now, that said, what does toxicity mean? What about a culture? This is also where David Mann talks about. He says, culture has to change, but you can't change it directly. It's like the air you breathe. You're not going to change culture, not directly, but you have to change it. You can't change it directly. So what is culture? And he suggests, and this is a partial description of it, but he suggests culture is a reflection of the management decisions that are made. So like toxic culture would be somebody did something and somebody made them wrong and they got fired or something like that. And But I do believe most of culture is a reflection of management. There's a history, of course. There's a belief system, of course. 
There's another aspect of culture, but this also relates to management. I've seen this. See, what I think keeps silos in place, excuse me, is the people at the top of the silo thinks they already know what's going on. They're already experts, so you can't change it. Epictetus once said, actually, I didn't get this from the Stoic books. I heard this separately, but uh, you can't learn what you think you already know. I love, uh, oh crap, what's his name? Uh, 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 Will Rogers, I love Will Rogers. He says there are three kinds of men. Those that learn from reading, those that learn from observation, and the rest of them have to pee on the electric fence themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry if you consider that vulgar. But no, it's, just, it's, it's awesome. So it's absolutely awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like, what Twain and, and Rogers say in their own way, it's not what you don't know that gets you, it's what you know for sure that ain't so that gets you. So I think a lot of the stuckness that's there is, is and a lot of the toxicity that there is people at the top think they know what's going on and they're not opening. Now I'll go back to the choice and Ellie Goldratt. And he says, command and control, the stuckness, he said, is not so much control issue as it is a comfort issue. A lack of understanding causes control, not that they want to own. Now, there are people who want to own the fiefdom and all that, but a lot of it is people are uncomfortable. So, so I'm espousing a theory here. I'm going to tell you, this is a theory. I've never actually done this, but you're getting me to think I'm going to try this the next time I run into this. So if you've got somebody who's on the top of the mountain and they have control, and if you recognize that this is more of a comfort thing, and if you recognize Upton Sinclair's comment, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when their salary depends upon them not understanding it, then as long as they think hierarchies are the way and I control this mountain, just get this. They don't want to learn something new because it threatens their livelihood. They don't want to learn something <clears throat> new because they already know it anyway. And if they recognize they don't know something, now they're not up there. They're down here with the rest of us, please. So, yeah, that's tough. You get how tough that is. Oh, yeah. So you got to, you got to, I mean, y'all get, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> but, <laughs> but from a coaching perspective, that's actually one of the rules is that you don't coach somebody that does not want to be coached. And that's as correct. a follow on of that is, is you only spend your effort where there's energy. If there's no energy, don't don't put your effort in there. Don't. Okay, so you're putting another constraint and you're mirroring what Chad Holmes once said, never sell a meteor to the dinosaur. It wastes your time and irritates the dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. All that. So that's why maybe this is hopeless, but I'm going to tell you how I've tried it. And actually, sometimes I've been successful. I shouldn't say I'm not sure. Sometimes it takes a while. And sometimes this is the advantage of being a consultant is they can fire me as a consultant, but so I'll go find another client where if it's your job, it's tougher. So that's why I'm trying not, I'm trying to be very clear about, I'm not saying everybody can do this. So they've got to want to make improvement. Mm. I agree. You know, I, uh, there's, there's a, I forget how many, like how many psychiatrists does it take to screw in a light bulb? It only takes one, but the light bulb has got to want to change. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm a little slap at you. That's very good. <laughs> well, I didn't make that up, but I've heard that one. Okay, so so let's talk about this. So what we have to do, and this is why leadership is so important. Leadership, leadership is important. I don't mean to downplay it, but it's important for a lot of reasons people don't seem to gather. If you've got somebody who's at the top of this mountain owning their fiefdom and they don't want to change because change is uncomfortable, more important, it's not uncomfortable, it's a risk to their livelihood. And somehow our brains are wired, that means a risk to me living by myself alone and dying in the street. I know that probably sounds weird to a lot of you. But if you look at the fears, there's this irrational cascading of, of our ego and how it goes. And that deep fear, is, it's so deep down, a lot of people don't even know it's there, but it is there. So and this is why people sometimes get angry. 
under fear is, I mean, under anger is always fear. Okay. Uh, and that's something good to know as a coach too, by the way. In fact, I need to put that in my chapter, a chapter in my book. I'm going to make a note. Uh, under anger is fear. And this took me years, by the way, as a coach. In fact, I still have to come back to that as what a coach is. Sorry, I rambled on this, but I'm getting there now. And this will give me an illustration of it. See, if leadership says, you know, guys, what we're going to do, I don't care about your silos anymore. I don't care about your management anymore. What I care about is results. And what we know is unless you work together, we're not going to get results because I've done this study on value streams and the value cuts across the organization, even though I've got silos. So each of you are managing in your silo, but I don't care about that. I want this flow across from the idea until the conception. So we're going to stop looking at silos. We're going to stop looking at hierarchies. We're going to start looking at the value stream across the organization. And that's all of your jobs. Now your job is not to be perfect where you are. Your job is to help everybody across the value stream. Now, when a leader says that, they've thrown everybody into chaos and fear, admittedly, but now what can you give them to be more comfortable? That's why leadership is so important. They give the target of this collaboration and you <clears throat> stop controlling these hierarchies and you start looking at the value stream. Now, everybody has to work together to get value. And usually that breaks the silos up because people start realizing mm -hmm. they can't own their part because that doesn't collaborate. You can't have these local optimizations. I, I came up with a really great example of local optimization. It's like here, I don't have air conditioning in an apartment. We're having our house remodeled. Thank God in two weeks, we'll be moving back in. No air conditioning here. So you know what? I could open the refrigerator door and ah, oh, it's so cool. That's local optimization because it's going to heat up the rest of the apartment. <laughs> so we don't want that. And value streams give you a way where you're now looking at the whole. And this is really an important piece. Okay, so now I'm gonna tie all this, probably something new will come up. I'm gonna tie everything I've said together in one other thing about coaching. So, you know, Lisa Adkins, you know, all these people I'd mentioned earlier, Diana Larson, great in terms of coaching style. There's huge value in that kind of thing. I'm taking a different approach in my being a professional coach. I'm suggesting that there are certain things you need to know, not your skill of talking. Okay, listening skill is very important. I actually have had years of training in that. Very important. That, that stuff's really important. But I suggest you're not going to change your personality or your ability in these skills in a matter of weeks or months, maybe in years. Now, it's, it's like the best day to play in a tree was 20 years ago. The second best day is now. Same thing with your personality skills, your ability to communicate. If you're not doing it already, then do it now because you're way too late. But if you need quick response, what you need to know is some of the mechanisms I've been talking about. Like, how do you look at a problem? How do you coach people so they can see what the right problem is with the skills you have in communication now? How do you determine if I've got to teach 20 things, what's the order in which they get the, the, the sequence of events so they'll understand it? What concept sets up the next concept, sets up the next concept? What insight might change the entire environment? Like I just said something, this leader, what, what I was suggesting, a leader says you're going to work together. This is what Bucky Fuller would call a trim tab. This is yeah. a very important concept. So Bucky Fuller talks about this a day he was on a dock. So I don't know Bucky personally when he passed away and I didn't know him when he was alive, but I had a friend who knew him <laughs> and I got all these great stories from my friend. And um, one of the stories, I think he wrote this one up, but I, I kind of got a little bit more personal. I know Bucky, one of the per, one of the things about Buckminster Fuller is he really wanted to change the world. And yet he realized he was insignificant all at the same time. That's kind of tough. And, and, you know, he's the guy who came up with Spaceship Earth, a lot of different things, moving electricity around. But anyway, he talks about he's on a dock. And he sees this really big boat. I think he thinks he says it's the Queen Mary's going by. Queen Mary's a pretty big ship. It's not huge, but it's pretty big. And he's imagining, yeah, the Queen Mary's like the world. And I'm going to swim out there and push on the bow of that thing and make a difference. And he's, yeah, exactly. No, that ain't going to happen. He's feeling a little melancholy about this. Oh, God. All this time I'm spending, and it's going to be like pushing on the bow of a huge super ship. 
So then the boat goes by. Now it's at the stern. It's the back of the boat. And he sees the rudder. He says, ah, that's how you change the course of a ship. But he knows that's not how you change the course of a big ship. Think about it. You've got a big rudder and you push that against the water. It's just push. The water will push back and just push that rudder right back. You don't change ships by moving the rudder directly because there's too much pressure in the water. Instead, there's what's called the trim tab. Now, you've seen these on airplanes. You've got the you've got the wing and then you've got an elevator and then you've got a little elevator. That little elevator is called the trim tab. And what's weird is the if you want the elevator to go up, the trim tab goes down. It's sometimes easier to see this on an airplane. That causes extra lift over that whole thing and the air, the whole thing moves up. And in a boat, a ship, if I want to go to the left side, it's called the port when you're headed forward. I can't move that rudder, but I have this little thing on the back of the rudder. Like if the rudder is 10 feet long and 20 feet high, on the back of this might be a foot and five feet, foot deep, five feet. You turn that in the opposite direction. So I turn the trim tab in the opposite direction a lot, but it creates a curve and that curve creates turbulence and they get air sucked in. And now you have air and water and you can move that rudder against that air and water. And then you lock it in place and the ship turns. Now, I always misunderstood what this meant until a really brilliant guy, Brent Jensen at Microsoft told me the real story <laughs> years ago. See, I thought it was like you were putting leverage on things. He said, no, that's not what he means. What he means is you're changing the environment. That trim tab changes the environment between a highly, a highly leveraged, the rudder side of the leverage works. So by changing the environment with the trim tab, you affect everything. This is also a lean concept. You work in the environment. Deming talks about working systems. It's really interesting. I've talked about about 20 different concepts and you see how they all work together. It's all about systems. It's all about how they relate. It's you understand most of the dynamics of the system and you don't worry about the complex things because with quick feedback, you can detect when something complex has caused a problem in the system. So you don't need to worry about it and you decouple things anyway. The leader saying you're working across has just changed the environment everybody's worked in. That's a trim tab. That's what you need to look at. Now, there are about a dozen trim tabs I've identified in knowledge work. That's one of them. There are quite a few others. Little things that change the environment that big people, a lot of people operate in. So that's how you make the difference, although, and, or possibly make the difference. You've got to change the environment and in, in lean and flow in theory of constraints. I got to say this carefully because Steve Tendon will come around here and beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't but worry, got, he's in Malta. He has to catch a few planes. Right, he's got a long way to go. I, I say that <laughs> lovingly. Steve, Steve and I, we used to do these uh, uncommon sense things and we had to the joking fight, me and Steve, and I ended up with a black eye, uh, figuratively, of course, but he was totally right about theory of constraints and it's one constraint. And uh, not, not that's what theory of constraints says, but that's actually what works. Uh, but, but the, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought here for a second. Oh, the, uh, the trim tab, yeah, and this. So, <clears throat> so uh, no, there's something else, the trim tabs, the working on, oh, okay, here's what it was. So lean and flow, lean and flow are very much about the systemic view and looking at everything. It's very consistent with theory of constraints, smaller things, visibility and all this. But what the theory of constraints tells us is where to look in this flow, look for the constraint. See, I, I don't say I do lean, I don't say I do flow, I don't say I do theory of constraint. I say I do flow, lean and theory of constraints. And I put it in that order for a particular reason. Not that it's the right reason, but it helps my thought process. I want flow of value. So to me, that's the purpose. <clears throat> By the way, if you know Don Reinenson's book, uh, Principles of Product Development Flow, Second Generation Lean Product Development, the fact that flow is in the title and lean is in the subtitle might give you a clue which Don thinks is more important. And I'm not guessing here. I've talked to him about this. Uh, it took me a while to realize this myself. I said, Don, do you do it this way? Because flow is really what you're trying to achieve. He said, yeah, that's the goal. So you've got your vision up front. Then Lean talks about systems, talks about value, talks about value streams, talks to you about management, talks about quality. So Lean gives us a lot of insights on flow. And by the way, if you look at Lean Thinking, which is still my favorite book on Lean, it starts with value, value stream, flow, 
pull and perfection. Those are the five values of lean according to those guys. So where's theory constraints and all this? Well, theory constraints got a lot of great stuff in it. It's got a lot of great practices. It's totally brilliant. I'm a huge fan. But adding to flow and adding to lean, it tells you where to look, the constraint. And then how do you alleviate that? Does that make sense? I, I know I'm oversimplifying it. Steve will say, Al, I'm missing something. And he's no, right. No. I, yeah. it, it makes a lot of sense. However, what I've found is that a lot of people... Um, Lose their so you know focus. The, however, I told you, he contradicts me all the time, but I've gotten used to it. It's okay. So tell me where I'm wrong. I'm just uh, no, no, it's it's not about wrong. Um, it's about it's about focus, right? So focus, we often right. forget we often forget um, that lean is about people. Yes, it is about people. So, uh, there's a wonderful talk by uh, one of the um, influential characters in um, in the Toyota production system that very few people know about, uh, and that's uh, Nampachi Hayashi. Um, he uh, was one of the disciples of Taichi Ono, and uh, he was responsible for for keeping the spirit of uh, of Taichi's insights alive in the. Uh, Toyota board of directors and uh, he's explaining that no 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 a lot of people misunderstand and think that lean is about this and lean is about that and they forget that what actually lean is about is creating great people that's correct that's, that's what we're building what... our our, <laughs> our corporation exactly. isn't the Toyota production system isn't about making vehicles it's about no, making I great totally, people <laughs> I totally agree and I was very yeah. slow to getting that um, yeah. even though Oh no! Tells you that in his book, the yeah. production. He, yeah, yeah, he puts yeah. that right out there. Yeah, and and um, I, I was just so mesmerized with the technology and the thought process and how brilliant it was that I I favored that for a long time. And then I think what actually shifted it for me was another great lean book by uh, Michael Ballet. He calls himself the Lean Sensei. The book's called yeah. Lean Strategies. Yeah, yeah, And in that book, he talks about learning, learning product, helping people learn and see what's going on. I realize, oh man. And, and it's interesting to look at something like the, uh, the ar arisal of Toyota and the Toyota production system, that there've been a lot of things about, you know, just in time and, uh, you know, uh, stop the line and stuff like that. But, but when Ono really started getting it together, it was when he he had equipment, surprisingly, after Japan had been bombed so much, but he didn't have many people who were skilled. So he said, look, we've got to educate our people. We've, and, and actually, I don't really know anything about his personality. I've heard some stories which may or may not be positive, but I mean, in terms of gruffness or whatever, I don't know, but I don't really care. Because one thing that, the most amazing thing I think about that book that I really like is his love for Japan and his pride in the Japanese worker and that they weren't showing up the way he knew they could. And that was his commitment. To me, I, I actually put a lot of Taichi Ono and Martin Luther King together in a weird way because both were about, about cre creating pride in a group of people that didn't have that. And uh, I, I don't know how I don't know how that relates to this, but it just seems like it does. Understand. It does. It, yeah. is, uh, it is really a, a key point. Thank you for that, Al. That trim tab that you speak about, the oversight capability or function or person in that uh, role has got that onus in order to focus on the people, make it better. That's right. Um, I, I wanted to just uh, touch on one more thing there. Um, I gave a talk last night uh, with, with one of the BMI chapters and um, the, it was about lean governance and, and oversight. And um, governance is not necessarily about whether you do the things right or the right things. Governance is about the people. Um, it, it, it needs to remain focused on building and developing the people. So thank you for that. I've got two more questions, and then we can start Perfect. wrapping this up. Um, cool. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you've shared quite a lot of your experience and a lot of your um, insights and so on. Let's look a little bit about some of your battle scars. And I'd love to just have a few minutes on each of these two questions. Uh, and you can you can you can pluck any any of uh, some anything from your um, uh, history or your background, 
or your work experience, what was your greatest moment with Oversight? Well, two come to mind and one might be oversight and one might be something else, but one where it was definitely oversight. So I like working and seeing patterns of success and challenge. And I had an engagement, in my opinion, it made money for net objectives, but it was a complete failure. Uh, I got people to understand, I got management to understand what they needed to do. They said they were going to do it. I was real excited. And then they decided they didn't want to take the risk to them to save a lot of pain of the people that were working for them. I was very disturbed about this. It actually literally took me years to get over because I was like, I felt I should have seen it coming. And it was one of these things where I really learned about how uh, you needed to attend to what people commit not just because they understood what to do, but were they willing to commit because of the personal risk they'd have to take? Okay, so now I felt real bad. Now, actually, I found out later, maybe I'm just putting salve on my wounds, but that I was like the eighth person in and they had eight people after me and they never did figure this out and they eventually got purchased. But nevertheless, I should have seen it coming. So now, two months later or a month later, I'm at another client. And I, we're setting up, I'm doing this analysis, we're figuring out what to do. And I hear them talking exactly like these guys were talking but before, with the first guys i didn't know it was a warning sign because i hadn't hit it before now i knew it was a warning sign now i'm sitting there and i'm thinking to myself oh crap i can't let them go down this route but i can't tell them why i know they can't go down this route unless i tell them i had this massive mess up I'm saying that nicely export and deleted <laughs> so by this time i've been a consultant long enough to know it doesn't matter how comfortable uncomfortable it is you got to tell the truth so i only debated for about a quarter of a second i mean i immediately knew I've, I've had longer debates on this one but this one i knew immediately i had to tell this i said okay guys i gotta tell you a story I said you guys are talking exactly like this other client i had that did not work and i just told them and I wasn't sure what they would do. I mean, they would say, well, we don't want somebody who has a track record of failure. Yeah. I mean, that's crossed my mind that that would happen. But their, but their response was, oh, Al, thanks for telling us that. It's so good to know that you're going to correct us. I mean, they really did. It was like instant. I was like, wow, that was cool. <laughs> that was nice. And that was a triumphant moment for me and a bad moment for me <laughs> because I've got a few of these now that I think about it. Not that way, but I've got something else. Actually, I want to tell you this other story as well. Yeah, you didn't have to be on the fence a second time. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have to be on the fence a second well, time. That's right. I'll, I'll draw here for you two more books uh, from uh, Ryan's collection. Uh, Stillness is the key. Uh, read it it's which, very good. which is exactly that moment that you you you've you had that little voice that you listened to so you were still enough to to hear it and say i gotta say something yeah, and, then, say something anyway. and then that takes you into courage is calling right because you practice the that's courage right. to say i'm gonna say this anyway right yeah that's right that's right so so um there's another thing that actually was very germane to all this. So, so back in, I used to be one of these 10 X programmers and I don't say that arrogantly because I wrote very fragile code 10 times faster than anybody else could write. <laughs> and I had a history of that. So it was fragile. There's no question about it. And I had a tracker. I could prove it. I could show you things. And, and sometimes it was really good code and sometimes it was fragile code, but it would get the job done. And it was like miraculous sometimes how fast I can write. But in 84, I had a contract to build the um, software for the Vancouver Expo 86 World Fair that was going to take place, or Expo, they called it. And this was the first time that interactive touchscreen technology, you know, 14-inch Panasonic players, huge monitors with touchscreen. This is the first time it was going to be used in a commercial implementation like this. Now they're in a lobby, but back then this was like massive cutting edge. And I got the contract for weird reasons, converting it from basic to C. And I was thinking, oh, this will be a piece of cake. I already have the system. All I got it to do is convert it. No, that's not what it was. Because <laughs> once words. they started realizing we were rewriting it, they kept asking for new stuff. 
and we had a very tight schedule because we had to build the system and they had to then build all the software and menu systems, you know, that you touch and go up to it. So the first couple of weeks, I get the basic system up. I'm writing the authoring system. Somebody else is, there are two of us mostly. And there's somebody else who's writing the runtime system of the thing. And I'm writing the authoring system. He's got the runtime. He's really good. And we're getting the system to the people who are actually authoring stuff. And then they would come to me and they would say, Al, we need this change. I said, no problem. I put the change in, but I'd break the code. And this went on for about two weeks. And then I started realizing, Al, if this keeps going, there's no way. Every time they give you a little change, it takes you three hours to fix mm -hmm. it. Why don't you take five minutes? There's no way you're going to. And I got really started thinking about this. And then I remembered how I played chess. I'm not a very good chess player. So there's what I call the queen syndrome for a beginning chess player. The queen syndrome for a beginning chess player is you look and you see, oh, I can't take move the queen there because I'll lose it. Then you look at all these 20 potential moves later as I'm thinking, I look at the queen again and I forget why I shouldn't move it there. I move it there, I lose my queen. Now that sounds like a funny story about programming, but here's what I mean by that. If there's something you notice and then there's a long time until you come back to it, you forget a lot of the times that insight. And what I realized, if I somehow had a mechanism to know I made a mistake, even if I didn't know where the mistake was, it had to be likely what the thing I just changed. Now with C++, you got memory overriding and shit like that. But I'm an experience, even at this point, I'm experienced enough to know when that's happening. So because it, it's different. So I hired this guy where I wrote these scripts and basically it would just take one system, run this set scripts. It wouldn't tell me what, what broke like where, but it would tell me something broke. And I figured if I just knew it broke, not three days later, I would knew what changed and I could fix it. And I hired this guy and I had him run these scripts 24 seven or, you know, all the time. And he would come in. It was funny to watch him because he would read a book, twist around, look at all the computers, see they were all still running. And then he checked the data. And about every couple hours, he'd come into my office and say, Al, you broke this. And I'd go like this. I ended up getting some impact here for, I'm just kidding, but I would do it. Oh, how stupid could I be? But I knew what I had done, so I undid it and fixed it. And I started blistering along because even with a lot writing cruddy code, by the way, in 97, I read Design Patterns Explained, figured out how to write good code. But in 83, I was writing crappy code very fast, blistered along. It was wonderful. This was, to me, the first time I did automated acceptance tests. That was 83. Now, you can say that was good, right? Let me tell you the embarrassing thing. When was the next time I did automated acceptance tests? 1999, <laughs> 60 years later. That's pretty embarrassing. I mean, how can I be that stupid? Certainly no MIT graduate would do something that stupid. No. But I've looked at that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've looked at that. I, the reason I wanted to throw this story in, including the embarrassing part, there's a big lesson. See, if you're not thinking about your methods, if you think what you have is a one-off, then it stays that way. I actually did this again. I actually recreated, I created something like Nexus back in 2007. I didn't realize I'd done a general purpose mechanism until a few months ago when I decided to finally look at what Nexus is. And I said, oh, I did this back in 2007. I even wrote it up. I just thought of it as a one-off. See, if we think about things as one-offs instead of how do we improve our methods, we do weird things like that. Okay, so Aldo, you had a second one. Yeah, so- or we, both. We, we, we asked you uh, what was your greatest moment. And the other question is, is what was your most frequent struggle with oversight situations? Oh, frequent struggle with oversight situations. Mm -hmm. I think getting people to realize it's oversight, it's partnership. You've got to come up with a better name than oversight. That's too loaded a word. Oversight is an overloaded word, pun intended. Um, you got to realize it's partnership. It's, it's about partnership. It's not one with authority over mm. the other. You said this any number of times, so I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But that word kills the meaning of what you mean by it. The word yeah. itself yeah. makes it so you can't understand what you mean. Yeah. Because yeah. remember, it's not what you mean. You say something to me, and that triggers this conversation in my head. An oversight will not have a partnership sound to it, no matter yeah. how well you explain it. Yeah. That's a powerful That's a insight. Question. I've got to figure that out. I've got to figure out what to do with that. So. Okay. Overseeing situations. 
I'm sorry, what? Overseeing situations. Yeah, no, over <laughs> is the word that's killing it. Exactly. You yeah. don't even mean overseeing. You, you don't even mean oversee. You no, know, it's you that detachment. The, it's the it's the leadership superpower of taking a step back, taking a breath, and noticing. It's reflection. Yeah. It's yeah. like real time yeah. reflection. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's paying attention, attending to what is actually going on, noticing. It's being present. Hey, that sounds yes. a little bit like uh, Ryan Holiday's book. So I'll wait for his <laughs> next book. How to solve this problem? <laughs> Very we good. need better language. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Most frequent struggle struggles i'm sorry what most frequent struggles okay i'll tell you what my most recent struggle is i'm very clear about this so as you can tell i think a little bit abstractly i think a little bit theoretical and and admittedly i'd like to say that i was 95 percent mathematician and five percent engineer until and i've always been an engineer to some level i understand it until reinertsen fixed me and i'm 50 50 but if I reflect on something Jerry Weinberg once sent to me, all, I might think I'm 50-50, but the reality is my 95 to 5 has gone from 90 to 10. Moved <laughs> <laughs> a little bit in that direction. So mm-hmm. I, actually, this is a big insight for me. So I thank you for that because I've been starting to think this is, I've been over, only people with strong egos would overestimate the progress they think they've made so I haven't moved from 95 to 50. I moved from 95 to 90. So my struggle is this. I do have this ability. This does not make me better. I'm not saying this egotistically. I really do mean this because it sounds a little bit in some frame as that. I have the ability to see certain things in certain ways, and I know I'm very smart. And I'll take that with not arrogance and not even pride. That's just my skill. Other people have different skills. My skills aren't better than other people, but I do think abstractly. I joke about this with my wife. Uh, did I talk about my wife and me, high tech, high touch? Did I already say that earlier? Okay. Yeah. So that's really true for me. I'm, I'm high tech. She's high touch. She is just, she's not as smart as me in math or engineering, but she is smarter than me when it comes to people. And I've actually taught her to, how to be as big a wise ass as me. So she's actually shown a lot of potential there, but but the thing is, the thing is, is I am having difficulty getting people who don't think abstractly to understand a mechanism where they can look at practices and see how to change them and still have it work. Now, I know it's possible, and I think I do a fair job. I think my good stuff isn't the conveyance of this, but is that I do figure out what these rules are, like the value stream impedance scorecard I talked about. But I'm still struggling with this balance. Um, You know, I'm still struggling with, I've got this model in my mind and I'm trying to not recreate my model. Maybe that is the problem. Maybe I am trying to recreate the model I have in my mind with other people. And that's not gonna work because they think different than me. And it's not a deficiency on their part that they think different than me because they just have different skill sets. They have a different approach. And this is helpful because I think I just really got this clarified what this problem is. I'm trying to teach them how to think like me, even though I say that's not what I'm trying to do. That's bullshit. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to get them to do because obviously I think the right way. I mean, of course you want to think that way. (laughs) That's ego. So what I have to figure out is not how do I get them to think the way I think. And I've known that, but I admit I think I've been doing that. I've got to get them to think effectively enough in their way to see how to use practice and theory in an effective way for the way they think. And the reason I actually, before this talk, I had this insight because I teach people and something happened in one of the workshops or somebody said something and I said, oh, that's interesting. She is relying on practices and solid stuff and ignoring this stuff I'm saying until she feels comfortable with it. And sometimes that's what you gotta do. And sometimes that's a disaster. I mean, really, you can follow things and go bad. So that's my struggle. I don't know how to do that yet. But one thing I've learned is when you don't know how to do something, this is, again, the obstacle is the way. What I do is I create a box bigger than what I used to have, and I say, I'm going to figure this out. And I don't know how to do it now. And I'm okay that I don't know how to do it now. But I'm not going to give up until I figure it out. 
And then I could ask people, how am I doing? And this is interesting because this opens up something else that you two saw. See, when we built the DAVSC, it made clear something very obvious, except it wasn't obvious until it was. We talk about working with customers. We talk about building something and then showing it to the customer, building something and showing it to the customer. I didn't do that with a Discipline Agile Value Stream Consultant. I built that workshop with the customers, with people like you. We would do something and we talk about it. And you would tell me what I, you know, Aldo would tell me what I left out and, and Horia would tell me what I did wrong. And it was brilliant. And I'm teasing, you know, but they, you know, it was, it was like this beautiful synergy of, of, uh, of collaboration that was really good. So now once you start acknowledging, see, this is the thing. Once you start acknowledging, you don't know everything, but you're committed to the result. Then you're now in partnership and the fear has gone away. I'm going to say one story. You didn't ask me this. You say, what was the most courageous thing I've ever done as a consultant? I know what it was. It was in 80, it was like 86, 87. And it was at this small camera company. They sold used camera gear. 86, 87 computers weren't that widespread, but you have to rate cameras. They're intricate devices. They're different <laughs> quality. They sold pretty much high line stuff, but midline to high line stuff. And I was basically, I built the whole application. I was their IT department. This is a small company, I don't know, $20 million. And, and my livelihood, basically, at that time, I was, they were my main client. 80% of my revenue was from them, maybe all of it. And I was on their board of directors because they knew I was smart in some business stuff and software. So I remember this meeting and we're talking about changing the whole business model and structure to rate things better and to do stuff better. And they're all talking about how they've got it digitized and, you know, they had the computer system, but they really needed to totally renovate it. I'm listening to this. And I know that the guy who has to do all this is me. <laughs> I don't have an effing clue how to do this. Yet I'm there being paid by them because they think I know how to do this. There's all reason I'm there. They're paying me my salary, my livelihood. And I know I don't know how to do this. So I'm starting to breathe a little deeper or shallower, I guess, <laughs> you know, like that a little. I mean, seriously, this was going on at least for a minute. I mean, that's not that long, but when you're in total fear, it minutes it's a long time. And I'm thinking, well, how can I kind of nod and figure out how to do this and not let them know I don't know and not let them know I don't know how to do this. I'm really in this. And then I realized there's no way I can do this without their help. Take a deep breath and I say, you know, we do need to do this. I don't know how to do this. I need your help. I don't think I'd ever asked somebody for help before like that in my business. It was scarier and shit. I mean, I was terrified. I can still remember this. I remember what that boardroom looked like. I remember how we're seeing the owner of the company was sitting straight across from me. And the moment I said, anything else, oh, yeah, we'll be happy to help you. I created so, that created the Now we work in partnership. Yeah, it was yes. no longer knowing what to do. I had skills. They had skills. Wow. So this is, goes back to my point about fear. I, I don't know if I mentioned this. I've said so many things. We talk about safe spaces and toxicity. See, the biggest fear is in me. The next fear is my team. Then it's the company. Then it's the world. You know, forget my family. I mean, that's true too, but... <clears throat> When we talk about toxic, we have to recognize that it all is in here. And this is why stoicism is so powerful because it lets me know I'm dealing with this and I do have to deal with the outside, but maybe I've got this control. I can't control that. Wow. Okay. That's really uh, very deep and insightful. Thank you, Al. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. helped me. I tell you, once I did that, nothing, that's why, that's why with this other client, it was like, well, I, I, I mean, there, you know, it was like, you know where you're going to end up. So why struggle? I mean, that's really what I said. I said, Al, why? the reason it took me a half a second was the thought occurred to me, well, shit, I can't tell them. I don't want to tell them, but you got to tell them eventually. So why struggle for 15 seconds or 10 minutes or whatever it is? Just tell them right now and get the pain over with. Mm. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Al. Oria. <clears throat> that sounds very much like the Mel Robbins advice. You know, uh, one, two, three, four, five, go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it, um, Al, um, I would like to offer deep gratitude for your um, 
intellectual tour de force um, really today. It's been a wonderful um, almost couple of hours that we've spent and it looks like it's, it feels like it's just two seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun for me. And I, I will do a plug here because I, I, uh, I, I want people to know, yes, I have studied hard. Yes, I have certain abilities. Yes, you know, I can put these things together. I mean, even I'm surprised how many different things I put together, you know, and that's just how my mind works. It's uh, diagnostically, they'd call it attention deficit disorder. If you notice a big, I like to call it rapid mind movement because it's one of my strengths and these guys know arm in my arm. In. But I believe that what I'm talking about can be learned. I don't mean the exact way I do it, but I mean, what I look at, yeah, how I yeah. piece it together, how I analyze it. And yes, it's in a complex environment. So you always have to be looking for the curveball or to use to use uh, European football, the spin on the ball that'll make it move that you're not expecting. So you always have to be ready for that. But if you attend to what's known and if you decouple things so you don't get a cascading sequence of things when something goes wrong, I believe people can learn how to do this. And I started something I call the Amplio Community of Practice Guided Study, which is free. And it meets Thursday, seven to, well, seven to eight mostly. And then we have 30 minutes of added questions if people want to hang along. We met the first time Thursday, today. We'll meet in two weeks. You can check out my website or send me an email or however you have the contact. And I think that actually helped because I've been thinking about this a lot. Because I think our, our space of how we build business and how we work together needs a major change. We're kind of operating at this level when the potential is up here. It's known. We don't have to discover anything except how to implement it. And this is, I won't say my payback. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I do have a mission to help, but I don't feel like an obligation. It's just part of my mission. But it's what I'm up to. And I think it can help people a lot. And I guess I am very service oriented that way. I mean, that's uh, how I've always been. And I think if you're interested in what I'm talking about, you don't have to agree with me, by the way. This is not Al's leading this. This is not the Al show. This is trying to create a new way of working. And there are lots of people who do this, but we haven't banded together. Mm. So I've decided, well, I'm just going to do it on my own i'm going to put it out there people want to join that's fine but i've set the structure because i'm learning how to do ongoing education so if this sounds at all interesting to you please contact me look uh look at my website successengineering.works and um should be easy to find but just search for community of practice and you'll find it and i really have enjoyed this I just, this has been fun i always like talking to you guys but <laughs> this has been really a delight it's been a real okay. delight and useful now the feeling I get is that there's a lot more to talk about, so oh, yeah. I look forward to to have you with us again in a few months. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Once you've had a chance to maybe uh, see what some of the other um, interviewers are, um, uh, interviewees are uh, are up to, um, and uh, that that'll give us more to to delve into. Sounds great. Enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hopefully, for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Aldo. Sorry. Thank you for your time. Um, this we closing off. This is uh, Aldo Roll, and this is Horias Lushansky. Thank you so much. See you soon.